The Lord be with you. And also with you. I have a lot of announcements to make today. The first is I would like to introduce my wife, Sandra. She won't stand up. <laughs> Good morning, Sandra. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. She, uh, she will join us on special days, but she's an officer at North Raleigh Presbyterian Church and has obligations there. And plus, she says she's heard most of my sermons. <laughs> so. The other thing is, I hope you noticed the television in the back. Uh, at seminary, they taught us to use the titles of the sermons to pique your curiosity, not to tell you what the sermon is. And so, as we have become more of a graphic-oriented community of faith, I like to use graphics in exactly the same way. So you will see on Facebook and at the back of the church pictures to pique your curiosity instead of tell you what the sermon is. All right? The other thing is uh, the women of the church are resuming their faith circle and meeting at uh, November the 2nd at 10 a.m., and all are invited to come and be a part of this fellowship and study. The Trinity Book Club is ongoing. Check with Fonda Page for details on when and where and what book is being read and discussed. And Trunk or Treat. I enjoy Trunk or Treat. I'll be here with my wife's car with the back open and candy. Maybe a ghost. Um, you can see that the shoe boxes are starting to pile up for Operation Christmas Child. The details for that are in your bulletin. And I've been told that there are parts of the sanctuary where it's a little difficult to hear. And I've tweaked the PA system. I bought a new microphone uh, for the uh, lapel mic and tweaked it as much as I can. If you still have trouble uh, hearing, I've printed bulletins, I mean, I'm sorry, printed sermons and put them on that little shelf in the hallway so that you can keep up with the sermon by reading it with me. Oh, and the other thing is I hope you've noticed, whoa, what happened there? Somebody turned on a microphone. Oh, okay. <laughs> Turn, yeah, there you go. Uh, I hope you've noticed that I moved the passing of the peace to the beginning of worship. When you worship in a Jewish synagogue, you go into the vestibule and you will be greeted with the words Shabbat Shalom which means Sabbath peace. And I've always thought it wonderful that they had a special greeting for each other when you went to worship on their special worship day. And so I like the passing of the peace to be more of a greeting and move it to the front of the service and also that keeps it from interrupting the flow of the service when it's later on. So with that, please stand. And may the peace of Christ be with you. Wonderful. Now, stand for the uh, call to worship. <laughs> Our souls thirst for God, for the living God. Let us worship God.
do not know what we do not know. Our deepest sin is hidden from us. We confess what we know, trusting God to know it all and to be merciful. Let us confess our sins together. Oh God, sometimes the journey is too much. We can't go on, and we complain that we are all alone. It seems nobody cares, not even you. Our strength is gone, and we are ready to give up in those times when we are consumed with self-pity and convinced there is no hope. Send your spirit into our hearts to remind us of your sustaining grace. Strengthen us that we may go confidently on our journeys, carrying out the mission you have given us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Bow your heads with me now, please, in prayer as we ask for illumination to hear and understand the scriptures that are about to be read. Let us pray. O oh God, your word is more precious than fine gold and sweeter than purest honey. As we turn to your scripture, send your Holy Spirit to infuse your word with truth and grace so that the good news of your love would shine before our eyes and delight our senses, so that we cannot, uh, so that we cannot help but respond with wonder, faith, and trust. We ask this in your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's first reading is First Kings chapter eighteen, verses thirty-six through forty. You can find this in the Pew Bible in the Old Testament section on page three twenty-five. Listen to the word of the Lord. At the time of the uh, of offering of the oblation, the prophet Elijah came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known that this day that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things that you're bidding. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so that the people may know that you, O Lord, our God, and that you have turned your hearts, you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell upon them and consumed the burnt offering, the wood, the stones, the dust, and even licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord indeed is God. The Lord indeed is God. Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal, and do not let one escape. Then they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the Wadi Kishon and killed them there. This is the word of the Lord. Now, those of you who consider yourself children... There you go. 
I've decided I'm going to let you sit up here where you're used to, since I've got a microphone that works. Uh, spent a little money and did some stuff tweaking with the PA system. You, it, even though it's old, it still works wonderfully well. Now, I'm going to do something, and I'm going to ask the adults to cover their ears. And I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to bend over, and I'm going to turn the volume up. Now, wasn't that pleasant? Do you know what that's called? You don't know what that's called? Boy, you're going to learn something today. That's called feedback. Because what happens is the sound from the microphone, I mean, I'm sorry, the sound from the speakers goes into the microphone, that goes back to the amplifier, that goes back to the microphone, and it, and it makes that really weird, loud, unpleasant sound. And it's called feedback. That's one kind of feedback. Now, there's another kind of feedback. Have you ever eaten at a place and then had it? You all have phones? Yeah. As you get in your car to leave, it pops up on the phone and it says, would you like to tell us how much you enjoyed eating here? Yeah, you've done that. Yeah, isn't that something? I never answer them. But uh, what they're asking for is feedback. That's what you call that when you, when you answer somebody, right? Well, you all are just not as amazed as I thought you would be at learning all this. <laughs> There's one other kind of feedback, and that's the kind that comes from God. When you pray, have you ever stopped after you've prayed to listen to God? You have. Have you heard God? No, because God doesn't talk to us in English, does he? I've never heard God speak to me and say, get up and go somewhere and do this and that and the other. But what I have done is I have prayed and then stopped to listen. And all of a sudden, I know in my heart that God has called me to do something. Like when you have somebody who's treated you really bad at school and you pray for them, and I hope you do, then after you've prayed for them, all of a sudden you realize you're not quite as angry as you were. And that's God feeding back to you. There you go. I am so glad to see all of you here. It's nice to have children in church. Let's pray. Gracious God, remind us always, after we've prayed, to listen, to see if you have some feedback for us. Amen. Good day. Thank you all for coming.
I will normally have an Old Testament and New Testament lesson, but today's lesson, I wanted to put the sermon text into context with what had gone earlier. So instead of reading a whole bunch at one time, I broke it up a little bit. So remember that Elijah had all those prophets killed. Actually, Elijah did it. And with that, the second scripture lesson. At that time, he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. And they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. The Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance to the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets before the Lord. I am left, I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Arm. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Japhat, of Abel Mehola, as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu will kill. Whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. Yet, I will, have, I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed down to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. This is the word of the Lord. I love this story from 1 Kings, especially the part that says, A sound of sheer silence. An oxymoron in the New Revised Standard Version. And I love that translation. Martin Luther's translation started the tradition of saying it's a still, small voice. Some of the more modern translations say simply a voice. Some say a quiet voice. The word is seldom used in Hebrew for voice. And it means literally a light voice. A still, small voice. And I love the oxymoron, sheer silence. We have confused this with our conscience, with the small voice inside ourselves, and probably with good reason, because Elijah had just done battle with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. The part that was read a little earlier, Jezebel's prophets, before that, the prophets met Elijah on Mount Carmel, and he tried to get them to start a fire burning on their altar. And they couldn't do it. Not even with all the matches in the land, they couldn't do it. They beat themselves. They prayed to Baal. They cut themselves. And they couldn't get the fire started. And then it was Elijah's turn, and he doused his sacrifice with water three times. I believe so much water that the trenches around the altar were filled. Then he prayed to God and fire fell from heaven and barbecued his sacrifice. And then Elijah had those prophets killed. And then because Jezebel wanted to kill him, Elijah fled. Some of us might have called Elijah a yellow-bellied sapsucker. 
or fleeing in the face of danger. Some of us might have said discretion is the better part of valor. But no matter what his reasons, he fled. He fled to Mount Horeb and hid in a cave. And God called him out of that cave. And Elijah looked for God in the wind that blew. But God was not there. He looked for God in the earthquake. But God was not there. And he looked for God in a fire. But God was not there. And there's a little aside here, a rabbit trail, that I want to chase. That's what preachers call it when they wander from the main point of their sermon. But the wind and the earthquake and the fire are important symbols here because the ancient people thought that everything in the world was made up of simple elements. Some had one, fire or water or ground, earth. Some had four, earth, wind, rain, and fire. The people who worshipped Baal might have understood that Baal was present in the fire, and that's why Elijah begged him to try to start a fire. It might have been that they thought he was present in the water, and that's why Elijah doused his sacrifice with water. Whatever they thought, the contest on Mount Carmel showed the people that it was not Baal who was God over all those things, but God. And when Elijah went out of the entrance of the cave, he looked for God in those things, but God could not be found there. God was in that still, small voice. Isn't it wonderful imagery that God is using there to teach Elijah and to teach us a lesson about where we might find God or at least how we might hear God? But to get back to the main trail, we must get back to that voice. Not so much where it was, but what it said. Because it, it, it asked Elijah why he was there as if he wasn't supposed to have been there. And that's where we get the idea that Elijah had fled in the face of danger and was hiding out in the badlands like an outlaw instead of a prophet. And the still small voice came to him and asked, what are you doing here, Elijah? And you know what else is important to me this morning about this text is not so much where the voice was or where we think God is, but how we listen to God. How we hear that still, small voice. How we pay attention to the feedback. And one of the good problems we have with Scripture this morning is that it's written. And that problem is increased in Scripture because the Greek and the Hebrew, the languages in which the Scripture was originally scripted, had no punctuation, had no italics. They had no underlining. They had no exclamation point. So when we read Scripture from the original text, we have to read them like a computer scanner, one word at a time in flat, monosyllabic words. What are you doing here, Elijah? Well, we all know that's not how we speak sentences, and we all know that's not how we hear sentences. We use inflection and spacing. For instance, I could read that sentence spoken by the still small voice as saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? And when I say it that way, the emphasis is on purpose. What are you doing here, Elijah? What is your reason for being here? Are you here because you are frightened? Are you here because you're tired? What are you doing here, Elijah? And it's a question of purpose. Then again, I could read that sentence as saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? And by emphasizing the word doing, we're emphasizing the activity that is going on. What are you doing here, Elijah? Are you hiding? From whom are you hiding, Jezebel or God? It's a question of activity. Then once again, I might read that sentence as, What are you doing here, Elijah? And by emphasizing the word here, I emphasize place, Mount Horeb, the holy mountain. What are you doing here, 
Elijah. Why are you on holy ground? And place raises the question of focus and vision. What was Elijah's focus in that cave, on that mountain? Was it himself? What was his vision? Bleak? A still small voice came to Elijah and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And God said so much more than just six words. God allowed Elijah to examine his purpose, his activity, his vision with one short sentence, one interesting sentence. My friend and preacher, when I was doing accounting, Ray Barfield, used to say to us in church that it wasn't always what God was saying that was the problem, it was what we were hearing that became the problem. Have you heard God speak lately? What if we replaced the characters in this story? What if we replaced, replaced Elijah with us? What if we read that sentence as saying, What are you doing here, Trinity Presbyterian Church? What are you doing here? It raises the issue of purpose. What is the reason that we are here? When Marge Carpenter was moderator of the General Assembly, I heard her speak at a church near Statesville. She asked a searing question. Is this church a social club that prays? Many have become just that, a social club that prays. Is our sole reason for being here to pat each other on the back and feel good about ourselves because we pray? and sing hymns and listen to boring sermons preached by an interim minister? What are you doing here, Trinity Presbyterian Church? What is our reason for being? Are we here because we're afraid? What are we afraid of? Dying? Are we afraid of God? Of the world? Maybe even ourselves? What are we doing here? What is our reason for being? Or I could ask, what are you doing here, Trinity Presbyterian Church? When I ask the question that way, it puts emphasis on activity. What are we doing? Is the only thing we do pray and sing hymns and listen to boring sermons preached by interim ministers? Are we like Elijah? Have we come to holy ground to hide? To hide from the world around us that threatens our values and our way of living? Are we here because church is the one thing that remains fairly constant in a changing world? What are we doing? Is what, we, is what we're supposed to be doing, doing? Is it enough? What are you doing? And then we could say, what are you doing here, Trinity Presbyterian Church? Have you ever asked that question? Have you ever wondered why this church is here on New Hope Road, just inside 540? I have always looked at churches much the same way I look at preachers. I think God is at work in calling churches into being in the same way God is at work in calling preachers to churches. Now, I think the ultimate, ultimate answer to the question of place is we are here because God has called Trinity Presbyterian Church into being and placed it here. And once we've said that, we're still asking the same question. Why here? Why now? Why us? Maybe even why me? What is our focus as a church and what is our vision? I once ended a sermon with a question and I remember some of the people getting a little bit perturbed, maybe frustrated is a better word. One even said to me, I come to church to get answers, not questions. Sometimes that's impossible. Sometimes the questions have no answers, but the questions are still there just the same. And sometimes it's better if I just ask the question. And let you come up with the answers. That way the answers will mean more to you. And that way the answers will become more important to you. 
I can say this, though. After Elijah heard the still, small voice say, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I, even I alone, am left. Elijah felt alone, defeated, despairing. Yet he was not alone. God sent him from that place to find 7,000 who did not worship Baal. 7,000, that's an interesting number. In biblical numerology, seven represents the combination of the earthly and the spiritual. Earth and heaven, people and God, the trinity and the four corners. A thousand represents complete. God sent Elijah out of that cave to discover 7,000 people who had not kneeled down to Baal. Elijah was not alone, and he would not be defeated. You know, if we all stood right back there and looked out, this place might become somewhat of a cave to us. And as we try to discover answers to the question that still small voice asks us, don't be discouraged. Don't feel defeated. God is with us and 7,000 others as well. What are you doing here, Trinity Presbyterian Church? As we navigate through this period of transition, this time between installed pastors when you have to listen to boring sermons by an interim pastor, the same question that Elijah faced will be posed to you. Maybe with different words and in a different context, but it will be asked in all three ways. What are you doing here, Trinity Presbyterian Church? It won't hurt for you to start thinking about your answers now. Let us pray. Gracious God, may we hear what you ask us. May we hear what you say to us. And then grant us the courage and the wisdom to find purpose and mission and vision as a church that you have called and defeated. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we affirm our faith by repeating together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead, I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Be seated. Now let us turn to the Lord in prayer. Eternal God, we return to you in prayer this morning after more than a week of listening to the news replay the tragic events of last Thursday. And we continue to pray to you for the families involved. We pray for the families who have had to make funeral arrangements in a time of shock and dismay. And we pray for those who were injured. May their physical recovery be quick and full, and may they and the families of all the victims recover emotionally over the weeks and months ahead. As we approach the holiday season, we pray that they will be able to still find some joy in giving thanks to you for the plenty that we have in this neighborhood, even with an empty spot at their table. May they still be able to celebrate the birth of Jesus, even with presents missing under the tree. These events have reminded us that we live in a sinful and broken world, 
and we lift up our hearts in the name of the one we call the Prince of Peace, praying that we do all that we can to promote peace and encourage those who hold positions of power in this country and in the world to find ways to minimize the violence in our neighborhoods and the wars in countries of this world. And we pray for comfort. For those affected by past events, we ask that you allow us to live freely and happily in the present, rejoicing in the beauty we behold on our greenways and in our parks. And we pray that you enable us to enjoy the parks as our children and grandchildren swing on swings and safely enjoy the slides and the jungle gyms. And as this congregation that we call Trinity enters a phase of transition, we ask that you allow us to look back upon our past, to understand the things that have helped us to be a lasting witness to your grace in this place. We pray that as we work in the present, you give us energy and guidance that we might explore the ways in which we will be the best witness to your grace in the future. These are prayers spoken with our lips and the prayers that we lift up to you in the silence of our hearts. We pray through your Son who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us give to God God's tithes and our offering. Gracious God, knowing that part of why we are here is that we might be able to participate in your work in this world through our tithes and offerings. We ask that you bless what we put before you, that it might join with the gifts of others and change this world for the better. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
one more thing to say to you. What are we doing here? The Presbyterian Church. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance unto you and grant you peace this day and forevermore. Amen.